So the first thing, I've said this to people who've been on my courses before, but looking at the wing edges is very much more helpful than looking at the color of the main part of the wing. The margins and just inside the margins of the wings are the bits you want to look at most. Some of the summer species that we're going to see probably July time, it isn't at all helpful to look at the wing edges. You do need to look at the center of the wing. But at this time of year, it's almost entirely down to what you're going to see on the edges. Um, I'm just going to remind my wife that everyone's listening to her. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, my living room is connected to all the other rooms in the house. OK, and the background color gives you a clue to the family, but it's not much good for indiv uh, individual species. Now, you also want to look at what the butterfly is doing, because where it is and what it's doing are a really good clue. For instance, you can tell whether something is a male butterfly if it's chasing others about or a female because it's looking at the food plants where it wants to lay its eggs and trying to stay pretty much unobtrusive. What I've decided to do with these pictures is show you butterflies that we might see tomorrow. It's been a bit hard to judge. Most of the spring species that might have finished at this time of year normally are still going. But the idea is that each of you tries to think in your head, please, of the name of the species that we're looking at on the screen. And I'll put the name up after you've had a few seconds to think about it. So this one should be really simple for everybody, I hope. And we've all got peacock, I imagine, because of the peacock eyes on the wing. But the underside of the peacock is a bit more difficult to discern, not because in itself it's tricky, but because others look like it. So what you'll notice, I think, if you look at the peacock and get my mouse activated here, you can see that there's a relatively straight line separating this pale part of the wing here from the darker part nearer the body. OK, so that should help us. Other species, uh, sorry, other members of the same family, the nymphalides, this lot are all butterflies which have been around all winter and probably are still about, but in tiny numbers. The butterfly at the top left is a species which does tend to come out very early in the year, probably February most years, but it disappears again quite quickly. Once the females have laid their eggs, they will disappear and the males have probably gone already. The species top right is a species which is a migrant. And sometimes at this time of year, some years, we haven't got any at all. And despite the fact that it's been really cold and wet, they are around and we could well see one tomorrow. And at the bottom is a much more common species, I think, familiar to everybody, certainly from years ago. It's not as common now. But this butterfly is also now on its last knockings for those which came through the winter. So those species, I'm hoping by now you've worked out, are the comma with its ragged wing edges and look at the yellow inside the margin. So the margin is very ragged, uneven, and you've got these yellow lunules, they're called these little triangular marks. The painted lady, also an orangey colored butterfly, but with black and white tips. None of the others have got the same sort of pattern of black and white. And then the third of these, the small tortoise shell with blue lunules. When they fly past, the comma and the tortoise shell do look really similar. But as soon as they settle, you can get your eye, I think, onto the ragged nature of the wings for the comma. And you should be able to see these blue lunules on a tortoise shell unless it's really suffered. OK. Now, two species which share that black and white wingtip, look at the similarity in the pattern here, very, very similar. And closely related species, and both of them migrants, but the top left, this species can go through the winter as a caterpillar in this country. And so some, if we see these tomorrow, possibility that it bred right through the winter in this country, it was laid as an egg in the autumn and is fed up through the winter as a caterpillar. Now it's flying about here, so it's not been abroad ever. But equally, we could see some that came in at the same time as the painted lady, which this you'll remember is at the bottom here. So we've got red admiral with the black with the red stripes and the painted lady orange with this black and white wingtip. And as I've said, the wingtips separate it from the fritillaries. Now, 
if we see a fritillary tomorrow, it's almost certainly going to be because someone has released one there. I have no expectation to see any fritillaries. But if you see a fritillary later in the year, perhaps very late June or early July, be the first time I'd expect to see them this year because we're very late with everything, then look at the wing tips and you'll see that the black and white corners of the painted lady are completely different from the wing tips of all of the other fritillaries. And here are the two species again, underside. So this is the way you'd see them if they're perched. And I think it's fairly obvious which is which because we can see the red stripe here. And this one is more orange, whereas this one is blacker. So red admiral and painted lady. And I always think it's amazing how well this species is camouflaged on very dry, sandy ground. Sometimes you see them sitting on concrete and it's much the same, they almost disappear because of course they spend their winter and a large part of their life in the deserts of the sub-Saharan African region. So they have to be able to blend in with very much uh, more yellowy brown areas than the green areas of England that they visit relatively briefly in the year. Okay, one more brown species which is flying at the moment and you might just conceivably confuse with those others that we've seen. This one I'm hoping you'll know is usually seen in woodlands or on the edge of woodlands. This is a speckled wood. And the big difference between this and the others is that we've got these creamy blotches. So they're not lunules, they're not little triangles along the edges like the comma. And the wing shape is much more rounded. But in addition, worth noting that although there, eye, there are eye spots on these wings, the hind wing in particular, and here on the forewing, most of these creamy blotches are empty. That's important for later on. But this species has been flying for a while. We could well see one tomorrow, but when I was there recently with Nick doing a recce for this course, we didn't see one. Okay, so can you sort these out? Which is which? Hopefully you can see that there is a wavy edge to one, some blue lunules are even on the underside of another, a contrasting paler area with a darker area, and one which has got some blotches. And notice there is also this area of the sort of the veins appear to make the edge crinkly. So depending on where the light's coming from, you can actually see this rather fluted appearance of the hind wing. So have you got them all right? No need to answer me, but let's see. Comma, wavy outline, small tortoiseshell bluish margins. Peacock, less contrasty than those, but still there's a border, isn't there, between the two, quite straight. And these various, I've called them eye spots, but let's, would have been better if I just used the word spot. But look at the prominent veins and the way that they separate the hind wing into little areas. Okay, so those are the nymphalid species that we might see. The speckled wood is in that group, but it's also in the subgroup of nymphalids, the brown species, but it's the, the earliest one flying in the year. So we're going to go on to the whites. I'm assuming that there are no questions or that I'm talking to myself. I'll just check. Is anyone else still there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, one person. Hooray. Thank you, Susie. Well, you and I can do this together then. We're here too. Oh, you are here. All right. OK, good. Just that nobody said, hang on a minute. That doesn't make any sense. So either it was, did make sense or everyone has gone to get their meal. Um, we're looking at the whites and we're starting with two members which are in the white family, but obviously quite different because they're both yellow. This one, the wing tips are a clue, the best clue to separating it from this one. When they fly past, they are both yellow. Normally, this one looks very pale yellow, like a lemon color. And this one is a darker yellow, like a custard color. But you can see this species on the right with exactly the same sort of coloration as this species on the left, because we get pale versions of this species. And hopefully you've guessed what they are from the B and CY, the brimstone, 
and the clouded yellow. I don't think we're going to see a clouded yellow. Be very surprised. It's a bit early in the year for them to be this far north. They are in the south of England at the moment, but I don't think they've made an incursion to the north because we've had so much um, northerly, northerly wind, cold wind, that will have kept them pinned in on the south coast. Okay. Now the yeah, whites are... Watched, yeah, I sorry. I brimstone today. It never landed. They just seem to fly on forever. Is there any... Is that normal for a lot of these butterflies? Well, it's very normal for all the whites. And I was just about to say, you've, you've um, made that comment perfect timing because I was about to say, now we're going to look at the whites and they're really tricky because they look similar and they hardly ever stop. But that, that's equally true of these two, which is why I mentioned the way they look when they fly past. This one looks lemony and this one looks custard colored, unless you're unlucky enough to get one, which is the much rarer um, pale version of this particular species. So usually the male and female of this one are both custard colored, but there are some females, a small percentage of the population that are very pale and they look lemony like this, but pretty much for certain tomorrow, if we see anything lemony yellow fly past, it'll be a brimstone. Um, they, they very rarely settle. I'm afraid it's just one of those things. They do settle to take nectar, but they spend an awful lot more time flying about or sitting somewhere completely unobtrusive and you'll not spot them. So let's get into the whites and please feel free to ask questions because these probably are the trickiest group in my opinion, largely because they do just fly past and you've got to accept when that happens, you cannot identify them. Sometimes you're really lucky and you can tell them apart because they've come so close and maybe done a, a sort of a floating glide past you. So you've seen them carefully enough, closely enough, you've seen the detail, but usually there's no chance. So we've got one here with very small amounts of gray scales that come just round the corner but it's more like a triangular smudge. And here, another species with a large amount of black coming right round the corner. And it's extremely helpful, as it says in the text, the large white has a large L, large L, okay, large and L, very helpful, of black. So I'm hoping that you've worked out which one is the small white and which one is the large white with a large L. And you'll notice that I've put M and F. And the perspicacious amongst you will have already guessed that that's because this is a male and this is a female. Now, unfortunately, an awful lot of identification guides show a picture of a small white male and a large white female. And people think, ah, the large white has two spots and the small white has one. That's completely untrue. Both the small white and the large white have either one spot or two spots. The males of both have a single spot and the females of both have two spots and a little streak which is hidden in this view. So here we are, look, which species do you think these are? Which species would this be with a relatively small amount Bit of a clue there. A small amount of colour in the wingtip. One spot for the male and two spots with a little bit of a streak in the female. Now I can't remember if I put the name of this species up or whether I was just leaving you to guess for yourselves. We'll find out. No, I didn't. So these are both small whites because they've got very small amounts of black. It can be a bit darker than this, but it could also be paler but it's always a very small amount and doesn't come down this edge of the wing, apart from about to there, which is always above this spot. So the females, this mark comes down a little further than it does on the male usually, but it never comes as far as the vein here, never that far, and usually only to this vein above that black spot. Okay, so small white. 
small amounts of black. And here are two more females. And unfortunately, the text at the bottom gives it away rather, but you might still be trying to guess without cheating and reading it all. What we have on the left with these pointy wing tips should be fairly obvious because we just saw that only a moment ago, a species with these pointy wing tips. So this one, as it says, the brimstone female looks very white in flight. This one is a species we haven't looked at yet, the green veined white. And what I'm hoping you can see here is that this one, which just like the female brimstone is a female green veined white, it's got these little triangles coming in. Perhaps you could call them chevrons. But instead of being a smudge, it definitely comes down the wing further, doesn't it? As far as the bottom of this vein. But there are little marks coming in at the wing edge. Now, this isn't always quite as clear as in this specimen. And as I said, for the small white, the females tend to be slightly better marked than the males. So this can be very pale and you have to look very closely, but it's almost always possible to tell if you look closely and the butterfly is sitting still in front of you, you can nearly always see that there is more marks on the edge here than along the top on a green veined white. So we've got some undersides, three white species. They are the large, small and green veined white. And which one is which? This is a small white because hopefully you can see there isn't, you can just see the black through the wing as a yellow mark. And there isn't very much of it. Down here, look how much, sort of giving the game away, but see how much black shows through. This has got far more black on it, this particular green veined white, but the scales on the underside should make this a very easy identification. And notice too, that the scales, these gray colored scales run along the veins. We'll see some other species where that isn't true, but here they run along the veins and here they're just scattered about. In the small white, mostly below this mid vein, and in the large white, equally above and below. But you probably won't need to know about the dusting of the scales on the hind wing, because if you can see the forewing, these are very different. Much more obvious black showing through here. Okay. Quick question. Yeah, please do. How, how much bigger is the, the large than the small white? Um, it's one of those things where it's a little bit like a piece of string, you know. It, the small white is normally about two thirds the size, perhaps even three quarters the size of a large white. But unfortunately, some small whites, the females, are slightly bigger and the male large whites are slightly smaller. So there's almost an overlap in their size. The large whites, you know, definitely on average are, de are bigger, but you could be unlucky and see a large white that was almost exactly the same size as a small white. So when they fly past, it really is tricky. The large white is about the size of the brimstone. If that helps, the brimstone is bigger yeah. than these. Yeah. Uh, in, in my slides, I've tried to show you the relative sizes by putting the bigger butterflies in as a larger picture, but it, it isn't supposed to be absolutely, um, what's the word, to scale. So if we go back okay. to the brimstone, the brimstone I've tried to show here is larger, perhaps it doesn't come across very well, than the green vein white. And when we had a brimstone here, it's bigger than the clouded yellow. It's the, the biggest of the whites, well, apart from the swallowtail, but we're not going to be seeing that, I expect. And the small white here, I've shown it to be nearly as big, but I think you can see that the large white is a bigger, more powerful butterfly. So okay. that's a very good question. Thanks. Sorry, Nick, can I? Yes, please. Sorry, Nick, it's Mark, it's Mark speaking. I just, um, I just noticed on your photos that, on, especially on this one, that the head color 
one the the top right seems a lot darker true the yep. is, can that be used as like an identifying feature as well well if it's consistent it can i'd never noticed it before mark well observed it might be let's see if we go back that one doesn't look quite so dark does it that's a green veined white and this small white looks nearly the same color as that green veined white so i think it might just be i mean individual butterflies unfortunately they do show variation but if we see green vein whites tomorrow let's have a very good look and see if they've got dark heads when you look at them from this angle it, it, you might be right um there are often small things like that like the color of the legs or whether they've got different colored feet to the rest of the leg and so on which are species specific but we tend to go for the the wing shapes and patterns because they're a bit more obvious from a longer longer distance but well, good question thank you Thanks. okay now this one should be easy i think and if it wasn't easy enough i've just mentioned ot and orange down there which should make it absolutely simple but th there is a unfortunately one problem with this species the orange tip which as you might know that the female doesn't look like the male so in the other species they look similar but they just have different numbers of spots just between the sexes the difference is whether there's one spot in the male or two in the female but the orange tip has an, an extra trick up its sleeve every single orange tip when it's settled looks just like this whether it's a male or a female and by the way this is here because this is an orange tip egg so it's often possible to prove that orange tips have been in the area even if you can't see one at the time because they lay these little orange eggs on the seed pods or the stems of the flowers of this flower which is cuckoo flower and jack by the hedge and one or two other crucifers so here's a female orange tip now you'll see i've pointed to these checkered wing margins there's a, a fairly even amount of dark gray along the leading edge and round here coming well below the spot which is much higher on this species so it's a different pattern there but these checkered wing margins let's go back it's on the male as well look but we don't notice it on the male because we think oh it's orange and we then don't look at this detail but the only white species with this checkered border is the orange tip so if you see one settled like this with the wings open and you can see this checkered border and the fact that this spot is both bigger and higher than it would be on the small white and the green vein white, then you know you've got a female orange tip. So it's a female with a single spot. Slightly confusing, I'm afraid. And just for um, comparing it with chevrons as i've referred to them little, little triangular marks here on the green vein white i think you can see it's completely different this is a checkered black and white edge to a dark gray mark and these are little bits coming in there is no such checkered margin there isn't any hint of a margin actually on the green vein white the wing seems to end abruptly but here there's definitely a an edge outside the colored markings if that makes sense. OK, so we're into a new group now called the Lycenids. Before I go on, does anyone have any other questions about the whites? No, thanks. Thank you for answering. Uh, I, I would have taken silence as no questions. Uh, so here we go. Um, now, this species, which is at the top, different species at the bottom this species at the top is flying around but you hardly ever see more than two or three on one site and especially so in the spring when you're quite lucky if you see two or three at all on any one site more likely one occasionally quite how they find each other the male and female of this species slightly beyond me because you only ever see them in tiny numbers but obviously they do because by the late summer they can be as numerous as to see four or five together in a single field. But anyway, this species 
is the only British species with an bright orange forewing and then an almost completely black hindwing with this orange margin. And that orange margin is visible on the hindwing as well. Peculiar that this is so dark, the hindwing here, and then the hindwing on the underside is so pale, which could be a confusion. And that's why this species does get mixed up with this species, because they do look superficially similar, don't they? But this is the top is a Lycaenid species, which all of you have worked out is small copper. And the species down below is one of the browns, about the same size, maybe very slightly larger. But this is a small copper, small size, and this is a small butterfly, the small heath. Now, as I've said in the text, but I'll repeat it verbally, this white mark here is the best clue to a small heath. You can sometimes see that eye spot, not always, because it sometimes closes its wings even more completely. But there is always this white streak visible and it never goes beyond this. This is actually a very well marked small heath in that this white streak is longer than it usually is. It normally finishes there but this one extends a little bit further. So a small butterfly, which looks orange in flight, but when it settles is basically gray with a white streak on the hind wing. And that white streak only goes halfway across the hind wing, small heath. I shall be testing you later. Okay, while we're on the subject of these small orangey things, there are two species we might see Last year, somebody released the species on the left, which we would not normally expect to Aston Rowant. And this species on the right is also not present to Aston Rowant, but some did turn up, up um, they were released in 2019. So I wonder if people know what they are. This one, as it says, well, doesn't say particularly it's this one, but you can see this one is supposed to show as being twice the size and the colored bands are more contrasty. This one has a sort of pattern of dots and spots in little cells, whereas this one looks more like the field is separated by black lines, doesn't it? And I'm hoping that you know that this species is Marsh Fritillary and this one, the Duke of Burgundy. It would be great if the Duke of Burgundy was breeding at Aston Rowant, but I suspect it isn't just because there's not quite enough scrub. It's a butterfly the Duke of Burgundy, which needs the caterpillar food plant growing in scrub. And I think that Aston Rowan's a bit too open. OK, we're still with the Lycaenids and we're into the blue group of Lycaenids. And we've got two blues here, which often cause trouble. So what we can see here is a blue which is very common early in the spring and on the right. We have a blue, so-called, even though it doesn't look very blue, does it? Which is only just beginning to fly. The last few weeks we've heard of the odd one or two, but because the weather's been cold, they haven't come out in any numbers. They will be over this week. So which of these two is which? You can see that one's an HB and one's an SB. Holly blue on this side, very common in your garden. And the thing to notice is how white it is with black streaks. I always think it looks like someone's taken a calligraphy pen and made a little sweep to put the marks on. Whereas here, they might have had a calligraphy pen, but possibly some other sort of pen. Other sorts are available and they've just twiddled it to give a little spot. And then to make sure you can see the black spot, they've ringed it with a white halo. And this slightly grayer ground color with the circular spots is small blue. Now the small blue and the holly blue are peculiar among the blues because in the holly blue, both the male and the female are blue, which is unusual for the blues. And the small blue is a bit unusual because neither the male nor the female is properly blue, it's this color 
which is a very steely, slaty sort of colour. It looks blue in flight. Definitely looks blue when it flies because the contrast as the wings flicker open and shut between the silvery underside and then the dark grey upper side looks blue. But it doesn't look blue when it settles. And I've written it down here. Bold print about neither species having any red lunules, which makes the differentiation that it is either one or the other very simple. But then you've got to look, is it white with black streaks or is it grey, very pale grey, with black dots and white circles haloing. The size difference is not great. So coming back to that question about size, the small blue definitely is tiny. But sometimes holly blues haven't been feeding very well when there were caterpillars and so they're tiny too. Usually the holly blue is bigger, but not always. Now, having okay, sorry, looked at I some butterflies. Yeah, sir, yeah, please do. I had a small, I had a small blue butterfly, really tiny this morning, just flew past me as I was dipping spotted flycatcher, another story. It never landed, but it's definitely blue. And I would have said it's a small blue. Is that logical or you just don't know? Uh, I'm afraid you don't. Well, whereabouts were you? Hewenden Valley. Hewenden Valley. Sorry? By the stream. Yes. Well, it's relatively unlikely there, to be honest, because the small blue is not exclusively found by, but 95% of the time you find it within a few metres of kidney vetch. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember seeing much kidney vetch in the Hewenden Valley. There is some when you get onto Green Farm on the other side of the road from the National Trust um, Hewenden Manor. And there might be a little bit on some of the land around the Hewenden Manor itself, but I don't remember ever seeing it. So the small blue, which as you can see in the picture, isn't really very blue, does look blue in flight, but it looks more silvery blue. Um, it, was, it was a washed out blue and it was tiny. Yes. So that would well, that imply from what you're saying, a holly blue? I think it would, <laughs> but unfortunately, this is one of the things with butterflies, we have to accept that we're not going to be able to identify everything. I think it's easier to accept that with something like flies, where we know there are lots and lots and lots of little black flies and they all look really similar. Difficult to accept the butterflies because they look bigger and quite colourful and we always assume, well, we should be able to tell what it is, but you can't always, I'm afraid. And what you've just described is an example of that. If we knew there was kidney vetch, then we would have said, yes, you're probably right. But I don't think there is any kidney vetch there. Nick, am I right in thinking, and this is clumsy on my part probably, but holly blue tends to be quite a higher flyer as opposed to some of the smaller blues tend to be, that's probably not diagnostic, but another clue. Um, flying that, up that, higher into hedgerows and higher up into trees maybe. That's confusing because it was low flying amongst sort of nine inch grass, about three inches off the grass. In which case, ignore me. and I'll About 10 metres. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right, Nick. Holly blue normally flies higher. However, if it's going across a field, then there's nothing high for it to fly around, if you see what I mean. Yep. Holly blues tend to stick to the, the, the tops of bushes and hedges, even trees. Um, and they don't normally come down to the ground, but they do perhaps 20% of the time come down and fly low. The, the other confusion species with holly blue and small blue in this case, is common blue, which does fly low to the ground. So usually if you see a blue butterfly, very pale blue butterfly flying close to the ground, it's a common blue. If you're in the right situation, somewhere where there's lots of kidney vetch, it could be a small blue. And the holly blue does come down occasionally, but usually doesn't. So that's a good tip, Nick. I always say holly blue head height, common blue crawling around your ankles, um, because I like to alliterate, it helps me remember. So I'm afraid we're not going to get to the bottom of that one, Richard. It's one of those, a bit like the fish that got away. We're never quite going to know what it was. Thank you. Shall we move on? Yes, right. Um, female blues, just to make it more complicated, are brown. So here we have, on one of, one of these pictures, is of a female blue butterfly. 
which is brown, and the other one is actually a male, which is also brown. The male and the female of that species look identical. So hopefully you know that the common blue has a brown female with usually, but not always, a little bit of blue visible somewhere. Sometimes the common blue females look nearly identical to this, which is a different species called brown argus. But there are ways to tell them apart. And I love the little story that I heard somebody tell, which was that the brown argus has a brand new dress, which is bought for a special occasion, perhaps a wedding. And it looks absolutely pristine, very smart, very trim in this lovely dress. But when it's worn that dress a few times and it's been back to the laundrette or maybe to the dry cleaners and it's starting to look a bit dowdy, suitable for wearing to work, but not for special occasions, it gives its dress to the common blue, which just never has the same punchy look to it. They can look very, very pretty, but they never look quite so punchy as this, which is much more contrasty. The orange lunules are brighter, redder. The dark color is darker. And that black spot is usually visible. And the absolute, absolute clincher here is the checkered margins to the BA. Can you see? I hope you can. There are little black marks where the veins meet the white margin, but the common blue does not show those. Neither the female nor the male common blue. So the, both the brown argus male and female look just like this. The female common blue looks really similar. And unfortunately on the underside, they look very similar too. You'll remember we said about the holly blue, let me go back and the small blue, neither has red lunules down here at the bottom. And then when we go back to this picture, we see red lunules on the upper side and crucially also on the underside. Now the brown argus has both the red lunules to differentiate it from the holly blue and the small blue and black veins, which just stand out to help you see that it's a brown argus almost certainly, whereas this common blue doesn't have any of those veins going through. There are some marks where the veins come in, but they're not black. But absolute clincher is a, an extra dot here on the common blue usually, but no dot here at all. So the brown argus has a bare area. And also just here on the brown argus, these two dots have formed something like a figure eight or a colon. Whereas here, there is a smooth arc. Can you see it? So those dots join up in a relatively smooth way. You might argue is my d description of a smooth arc. But here, look, look how disjointed and broken that, that is. Once you know what you're looking for, if you see one of these and you look at the hind wing, you can see that different jizz really obviously. And you'll probably notice looking at these that, well, this one on the right, the brown argus, looks really silvery compared with this one on the left, which looks browner. Yes, that's true. But when you see just one of them fly past in the field and then settle so that you can see the hind wing, deciding whether is it silvery enough or is it brown enough isn't a good way. Look for the lines going through the margin. If you can see it, this colon or that extra spot. Those are the things to look for. OK, two blue, blue butterflies. And after what I've told you, you should have worked out which sex these are. So hopefully everybody's now thinking about the correct sex or gender, I suppose I should say. They're both males, and this one is a common blue, which is an attractive blue, but I'm afraid when this fella turns up, this one looks a bit shabby. Rather like the brown argus makes the female common blue look slightly second rate. 
This butterfly makes the male common blue look distinctly second rate. And I often say, if someone tells you they think they saw this species, they probably didn't, because when they see it, they know it. And they're usually jumping up and down and shrieking with delight because it's so beautiful. This is the Adonis blue. The Adonis blue does fly and could well be out flying tomorrow when we're at Aston Rowan. It's only on a few sites, but it, it is on the warmest sites and Aston Rowan is a warm site. I don't know if Adonis blue has been seen in our area. One of you might, but I haven't looked at the sightings page to check that. It's definitely out in other parts of the UK and I think it could well be out tomorrow at Aston Rowan. Let's hope we see it because it's such a beautiful butterfly. You'll notice that we're looking at the veins again. So you can tell a common blue female from the brown Argus because of the common blues, completely clear border, CB clear border. And the Adonis blue doesn't alliterate, but it's got really obvious black veins, even more obvious than those on the brown Argus, right the way around. And it's such an electric blue. It is absolutely dazzling. It's very difficult to get a photograph that does justice to the blue. So when you see one, you will you will know why people say, well, you couldn't really mistake it. You can see common blues, which are beautiful. And the blue approaches the blue of the Adonis, but it's never quite the same. Now, the undersides, unfortunately, of these two species, one of these is the Adonis and one is the common blue. Very hard to tell apart. If you just look at the spots, the shape of the spots, the way the spots are spread about, you won't get very far telling the two apart, very difficult. There is a slight difference, as you can see, in the color of the blue near the body, but that wears, so it isn't always a good indication. The best way is to go on the very obvious clear border of a common blue, and I'm pointing at it, so you're not having much of, not much of a challenge there, I'm afraid I've given that away. So the Adonis on this side, can you see the black veins going through the margin? So if the weather's a bit rubbish tomorrow and we only see blues settled, perched and roosting, we can look at the wing margins to work out, is that a brown Argus, an Adonis blue or a common? And all the common blues will have clear borders. The brown Argus and the Adonis will have the black veins going through the borders. Okay, here's a challenge for you. I'll keep quiet for a minute. What are we looking at? Three different species. So hopefully you've decided that this butterfly is a holly blue. This butterfly is a common blue. And this one with the obvious black veins is an Adonis. The holly blue, no red lunules. The Adonis and the common, really similar looking, but with the red lunules here, separating it from the holly blue really obviously. And you'll be able to tell me because you know what this clear, I won't ask you, I wouldn't be so rude as to, you know, even hint that you don't know, but there's a clear border. Okay, I think this is our last, no, it isn't not quite our last Lycaenid. This is a species we should see tomorrow, I really hope so. Absolutely beautiful little gem of a thing. Looks very dark brown when it flies past you, doesn't look green at all, unless you're very lucky and the sun catches the green, which is one of those um, sort of reflective green colors. When you see it fly past, it looks very dark brown. And unfortunately, it's a butterfly that loves to spend long, long periods sitting above your head height in a bush, hawthorn, rose bushes are quite popular with it, sometimes bramble, and it doesn't move for ages. So you can walk past it, easily walk past it because it looks like a leaf. But when we do get to see one of these, if we do, they are beautiful. Uh, the only green butterfly in this country the green hair streak. There are just possibly going to be a few of these before I do my next training session. 
So this hair streak, and I've put the name on because I wasn't trying to make this a test, is the white letter. The white letter with this solid black line here inside the red. Now, any of you that go up to the north, and I think I might be wrong about this, but I think Tim lives north, North Bucks, uh, or North Oxfordshire would be a, a place where you'd see the black hair streak. The black hair streak is going to be on the wing within the next few few days, perhaps. It's sometimes the black hair streak has flown in May in good numbers, but this year everything's been cold, so it's going to be late. But it won't be long before the black hair streak is flying about. The black hair streak is much scarcer, much more restricted. Um, the white letter hair streak is widespread, but you tend not to get very large numbers of them anywhere. The black hair streak, you hardly ever see more than one or two, even in the very best spots. Some of the best spots in Britain, you might see as many as 12 at a site, but that's you know a very good number. So these two species, I don't think they're gonna trouble us in the Chilterns for the next month. As soon as we get to the end of June and the beginning of July, the white letter will start to appear in the Chilterns. The black hair streak sadly will not. But I just thought I'd point the differences so that if you see a hair streak that looks like this, you can work out which one it is. And if you do find a black hair streak in the Chilterns, you will definitely win a prize. Don't know what that prize is yet, but uh, I'll be awarding prizes for anyone finding black hair streaks in the Chilterns because that would be a, a, an amazing discovery. I mean, Nick, I, I'm sure you are absolutely right because, but uh, our local ward is a triple SI, and the um, uh, citation for it actually says Black Hair Streak. Now, that could have been put in place in the 80s, I guess. I just wondered. Which wood are we talking about? Sorry. Hodgemore Wood, which is. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Because it broke up as you spoke. Yeah. Hodgemore Wood. Hodgemore? Yeah. Okay. Black hair streak. Yeah. Well, I can only well, say I'm very surprised. But, but, but um, you know, I did, I have tried to keep my eyes open for it, but not seen it. But, you know, I just wondered whether it, it had be, been there and, um, you know, lost, lost out because habitat change or something. Well, it's entirely possible but it's also very unlikely. <laughs> it's more likely a mistake, I think, years back. But I can't say it's definitely wrong yeah. because I don't know the records for that wood, but it'd be very surprising. The black hair streak has always been known in a, a broad band going from Oxford to Cambridge, um, almost precisely the line of that expressway that thankfully the government are not gonna build now. They're still going to allow all the house, housing and development, I think, but not with a motorway joining it all up. Um, and the black hair streak has never been seen, to the best of my knowledge, south of Aylesbury. So it'd be a bit odd if it was in Hodgemore, but there you go. I can't say it never was. No, no. Anyway, we'll move on. Thank you. That was an interesting yeah. interjection, and I, yeah. I didn't know that, so I'll be yeah. checking into that later. So white letter on the left, black hair streak on the right. And I put it in purple because I don't think we're going to see any of those in the Chilterns, but I could be wrong after what we've just heard. OK, we're into a different group now. We're into a group called the skippers. Two skippers here, obviously. And these two skippers are both flying around at the moment, one in good numbers. And if we don't see it tomorrow, I'll be very surprised because even if it's cloudy and nasty, it should be warm enough that these butterflies will be sitting on top of the vegetation and easy to find. So one of them is the grizzled and one is the dingy, which is which they don't look especially different. Probably you got this right, the grizzled, because it's a, an ancient term for black and white is on the far left here. And the dingy with its less obvious patterning it's still not quite so bad that it should be called dingy, is it? But it's less obvious patterning on the right hand side. One of the things you'll notice about the dingy skipper in the picture here, this is it roosting for the night. It's the only British butterfly which instead of holding its wings behind its back like the grizzled skipper is when it roosts for the night, 
wraps itself around a flower head. So if the weather's a bit iffy tomorrow and we're looking for butterflies that are roosting, you have to look for this pattern with a dingy skipper of a butterfly wrapped around usually a knapweed flower head. Not always, but they really like old knapweed flower heads from last season and they wrap themselves around it. And then this pattern looks an awful lot like the shape and the coloration of these old flower heads. The grizzled skipper, on the other hand, sits in the typical position of a butterfly, often on top of old stems of marjoram, last year's marjoram. And then this pattern also matches the marjoram quite well, but they're fairly easy to see because they sit rather obviously right on the top and the triangular shape helps you spot them. Now. Sorry, Nick. Yep, please. Would there be any chance I saw a, a dingy skipper in the first week in April? Yes, there, there is a chance. Dingy skipper can fly then. And we did have some early, um, early April days that were quite warm. I honestly can't remember what the national first sighting for dingy skipper is, but it's quite likely it was March because mm. it's a butterfly that can fly very early, but everything's been held up massively this year. That's one of the reasons that this talk is a little bit different to the one I might have given at this time of year, last year and the year before, because all the spring spe species are still about and the, the summer ones haven't really started yet. Um, so I think you could have done, definitely. Yeah. I was doing the Presswood butterfly survey and um, I think it, I was crossing, I think it's the Speen Road and there was one on the on the tarmac, but then I, I just couldn't follow it enough because there's too much traffic. But it just right. like it was that. Well, it is quite possible. And in fact, on this page, I've put a confusion species below at the bottom here which can be mistaken for it, but this flies later. It's, it's around now in numbers, but it flies later than the dingy skipper. So in April, that was more likely than this confusion species. And I've given away, you're supposed to be spotting the butterflies. Oh, what an idiot, why didn't I leave that comment till later? Anyway, can you spot the butterflies? There are two butterflies on this page and two moths. And hopefully you've spotted that this at the top here, is the Mother Shipton moth. And for those who don't know, here's the nose of Mother Shipton, the eye of Mother Shipton. Her mouth is gaping open. Perhaps she's swearing at somebody and casting an evil spell on them. And there's her sticky out chin, which she did really have. She did look, unfortunately, rather like this. And therefore, the, the moth was named after her. Um, Apparently she was quite a good witch and mostly sold sort of white magic potions to make people fall in love with each other and make sure that somebody's cow produced lots of milk rather than cursing people all the time. And down here, we've got another moth. This one's the Burnett Companion. And as I said, it would insult your intelligence if I asked you which of these two was the grizzled or the dingy, but the names no doubt were in your minds. So. There are going to be more day flying moths about tomorrow. Indeed, we could well see more day flying moths than we see butterfly species. I mean, more species of day flying moth than butterfly species. This one, I don't think we'll see it tomorrow. It's very late starting to fly this year, but we might. It's the cinnabar moth, startling red and black, not to be confused with the burnet moths that fly later. Here we've got the silver Y, that's the silver Y. Its Latin name is Autographa Gamma, and it is actually more like the Greek Gamma sign than a Y. Then there are two species that look really similar, and I've got a shocking picture here of the common purple and gold, which is also known as Pyrastra or Pyrostra, I can't ever say that, Purpularis, and that's often a really brilliant um, coppery colour here with purple on the hindwing, but that's a sort of faded version of it a few days after it emerged. And this one at the top is the mint moth, which you're probably familiar with from your garden. It's very common in gardens, but this one isn't. And it's odd that it's known as the common purple and gold, whereas this one's called the small, but this one is the one you see most often. I suspect in the past, this was commoner when there were fewer gardens and there was more 
rough ground everywhere, fields that weren't covered in fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. Anyway, uh, here we've got treble bar or lesser. You can tell actually by this mark here near the head. If this angle is a really sharp L, then it's a lesser treble bar. And if it's slightly curved, and I think it is on this side, you can see perhaps, then it's a less, it's a treble bar. So really tricky to tell those apart. And therefore quite often they're just recorded as a treble bar ag. And here we've got two butterf uh, butterflies, two moths, which have very similar patterning, this one being yellower. This is smaller actually, the grass rivulet, um, but that lovely series of little markings like water that's been lapping across a sandy beach and then receding to leave these lines is exactly the same on the yellow shell. This particular version of the yellow shell that I managed to get a photo of doesn't show those little lines quite so clearly as many examples. This one is very dark. It's often paler yellow and this dark mark that is always there in the center isn't quite so marked, but they're lovely little moths. So we might see them and we might see these. There are a whole series of moths called carpet and there could be five or six different carpet species out when we go out tomorrow and wherever you are in the next week or month. So you have to look very carefully at the wingtips to see if they're gray or pale, to look at this bar across the middle to see if it's broken here, because in some species there's a gap there, and whether it's got a pale space in here. So this one, not surprisingly, the green carpet. This is the commonest of them, the common carpet. In this case, the name works. And this is the silver ground, which we probably won't see till the middle of June, but a much paler um, carpet moth. And then I don't think we'll see this. I don't know if it flies. Does anyone know? Does this fly at Aston Rowant? I've never seen it there. It does fly Ivinghoe Beacon occasionally, very rarely. And despite the fact that it's large, you don't often hear of people seeing it. It's a day flying moth, but it also flies at night. So it's you know not particularly fussy when it flies. Wood tiger, beautiful, beautiful moth. Again, quite large, and it does fly Aston Rowan very occasionally, but I don't think it's been seen there for a couple of years. It's suffering a tremendous crash in population for no obvious reason. Forester moth, this sort of iridescent green moth. And then there's a family of longhorn moths, which have all got these enormous antenna. We could well see two or three species. Crambids, there are Ooh, I don't know precisely 35 different species and I'm going to bring my micro moth book so that if anyone wants they can try and work out which one we're looking at. I'm afraid I really struggle with those. I'm fairly hopeless on that. And there's another group called the plume moths and there might well be three or four different species of plume moth when we go out tomorrow. During the course of June there definitely will be opportunities wherever you walk to see plume moths. This one's one of the, uh, this one's probably the brown plume. And there are two or three very white ones, which are really obvious, beautiful looking moths, absolutely lovely things. So there are lots of day flying moths, but um, if you're hoping that I'm gonna help you with your micro moth identification tomorrow, sorry, you can do the macros, but I struggle with the micros. Well, don't struggle, I fail. Okay, skippers, are there any questions about uh, those moths that we just looked at before we just quickly get into the skippers. We're very near the end now, folks. You'll be pleased to hear. Do we um, record moths as well or just butterflies? Well, on your wider countryside butterfly survey, I have to confess, I haven't looked at your recording sheet, but I would imagine you can record moths. So you, you're not obliged, but I think you should if you can. Even if you can only do a few of them, you know, even if the only thing that you remember having seen and know the name of is, say, Forrester, which is so obvious with its green colour, or going back here, the Mother Shipton. 
um, then I think you should record them. And does anyone know whether the wider countryside butterfly survey recording sheet has a section for moths? No, oh, Nick, it's not. So it's, so it's not part of the formal survey. So you're not expected to count moths. But um, it's, no, exactly, yeah. it's a bit like on the breeding bird survey when you count, if you want to, there's the option to count mammals. Mm. Um, but it's not. So if you see something of interest, um, make make a note of it. And even if there's not the form yep. on the wider countryside, it's good just to send a note through and say, I saw a, a mother ship and all yep. whatever. It's all nice I was going to I was going to come to that later, yeah. but I just wondered if it was part of the formal recording because the, yeah. the transects that I walk is part of the recording form. They're, they're not written on the form. No. But there are spaces on the form where you can write in things. But when you get to the system, the system has sections. You can say, I yes, I looked out for all moths or some moths, or no, I didn't look out for moths. And the same for Odonata, damselflies and dragonflies. Okay, thank you. So you don't have to, but if you do spot any, you can record them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. When you say, Tim, that you can say uh, whether you look for them or not, does it actually allow you to enter them? The, the, yes, it does. Yes, sorry. Yes, the, yep. the, I, I when you're filling in the form, the the first thing is, when you're filling in the form, the first thing you say is, "I did or I did not look out for moths," and then you can oh, okay. actually you just type in the name, and it 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 does the, one of these matching things that says, "Oh, you started talking, typing F O R. Did you mean Forrester?" Okay. Yep, that's excellent. Thanks, Tim. It's slightly different with the transect sheet where the a bit like an Excel spreadsheet. There are different tabs when you're entering your data and you can click on moths and that you can have a, a list that's populated by them or you can build your own list, as you say, by typing them in and then the dragonflies as well. Anyway, um, let's move on. So we're still looking at skippers. If you've forgotten, we were looking at skippers with the grizzled and dingy and we diverted into day flying moths because skippers and moths do tend to fly about in similar ways and disappear from sight by some magic in front of you. You see them go past, you try and follow them and they seem to vanish. A skipper that will be appearing soon is the large skipper. And on this page, I've shown a large skipper, upper side and underside, and another lookalike species that will not be flying soon, but I thought it might be an idea to look at it so that we don't get any confusions with people thinking they've seen the other one, the SSS. So large skipper on the left here and silver spotted skipper on the right. Now, the biggest single difference between them is the strength of the pale markings. You can definitely tell them apart by jizz. Once you know what the flight of a silver spotted skipper looks like, you can tell it from the flight of a large skipper. As I've said, the large skipper flies higher and looks less forceful. It never seems to be quite so determined. The silver spotted skipper would probably, the way it flies, it looks like it would do well as a prop forward in a, a rugby team. It's really determined. It's sort of brutish the way it dives about. And the large skipper is a bit more delicate. I think delicate is perhaps the wrong term to use for a large skipper because it's a bit of a brute itself, but nothing like the thug that silver spotted skipper is. So the large skipper, relatively pale, patches, slightly creamy perhaps, but more like the orange ground colour that you see close to the body, extending into these darker wingtips. And the same on the underside, you can just see these pale patches on this greenish underside. But with the large, uh, so the silver spotted skipper, the silver spotted skipper has much more contrast so the whole wing is overall darker and these patches are overall paler. And on the underside, the same, much darker underside with much more obvious pale patches. Now, sometimes, especially the female large skippers can have what appear to be really obvious pale patches. But these three spots just here, one, two and three, they're blended together on this specimen. These spots are only ever visible on a silver spotted skipper. So even if you see a large skipper that looks superficially like this because that arc of spots is clear and stands out well, it's not a silver spotted skipper unless it's also got 
an arc of spots really clearly visible just here. But we're not going to see silver spotted skipper till July, even in a, weather, a year when the weather has made things fly early. It's July for the silver spotted skipper. Large skipper should be flying now, but I don't know that any have been reported in our, in our area because everything's late. And another confusion that we probably won't get in June. Here we've got pale creamy spots on the greenish background. And here, another skipper, but completely orangey, no hint of a spot. Large skipper and either small or Essex. I've made this point here about the size. The large skipper isn't obviously larger than a small. Um, when you see them both together, it is slightly bigger. But when you see it flying about, especially if there are no small skippers, you might well think to yourself, well, that's a small sized skipper. It's most likely a small skipper, but you need to look to see if you can find these pale spots on a slightly greenish hind wing compared with this overall orangey color. And I'm not gonna bother with difference between small and Essex skippers. We'll keep that till our next little talk because I don't think anyone's gonna see small and Essex skippers in the next two or three weeks. They'll be later this year. Large skipper should be about though. Okay, the browns. Um, the browns possibly slightly tricky, but really they should be posing no trouble, I think. So as it says here, the meadow brown has a single black eye spot with a white pupil, just one white pupil. So there, that's got a black eye spot with a white pupil. Uh, the ringlet has multiple eye spots, hmm, like that. Oh dear. Well, it can't be both. Whereas the speckled wood has lots of creamy spots. So I remember now we talked about that earlier. This one's the speckled wood. So which of those two is which? The meadow brown you can see in this, you know, picture where it's taken still and it's sitting very nicely in front of you with its wings spread. The meadow brown is paler, more orangey hued than the ringlet, which is obviously darker. And, but the best way to tell them apart, because male meadow browns can be really quite dark sometimes, the best way to tell them apart is to look at the hind wing, because just inside the margin, you've got lots of eye spots with lovely golden halos on the ringlet. But there's never anything on the hind. Well, perhaps I shouldn't say never. You might get an aberration with the odd spot, but almost never will you see anything on the hind wing of a meadow brown. You can also see, I think, and this is something I use when they fly past and settle at a distance so I can't easily see whether there is one spot here or more and whether there are spots on the hind wing. The contrast between this very silvery colored edge and the ground color is much greater than this rather gray lackluster margin on the meadow brown and the interior ground color. That's very helpful in fresh specimens. Okay, so here we've got the undersides. Can you sort them out? There's one cropping up from earlier and the three that we saw on the page before. Meadow brown and ringlet. Looking at the hind wings, we can see no eye spots. Although, as I say, occasionally you find one with a couple of eye spots there. And here, really obvious eye spots, all ringed in this golden halo, beautiful butterfly. And here we've got one which has got eye spots here, but it's also got that fluted appearance that I said, crinkly look, that's a good description. And notice this little fella, which we saw earlier, and that light streak only coming halfway down the wing. Whereas here, look, it goes right the way down on a meadow brown. Meadow browns should be flying by now, but I don't think they've started because the weather's been so cold. They should start next week and ringlets perhaps three or four days later. So within a fortnight, all these will be flying together. And have you worked out what these two are? Small heath, of course you have, you remember. Small heath with a short white mark here, or pale mark, and speckled wood. One more brown, which 
will be flying by the end of June. And it's a brown species, even though it's black and white. So some people I have known mix up this and this, but I hope you can see that these are quite different. I said to you, note that the gray scales go along the veins of this butterfly, whereas here they go across look. So what's this one? I expect everyone knows this, marbled white. And you all remember that this is a green veined white. Beautiful butterflies, marbled whites. And it's nice to see that during the last 30 years, they've become much more widespread and fairly common in places. OK, I think we're into our last two species to separate and we're not going to see either of these tomorrow. Well, perhaps I shouldn't say that because you never quite know with wildlife, do you? But I'd be amazed if we see either. They normally begin flying at the end of June. So this is the species that flies second. This one would normally be at first by a few days. This is a species which, as I've tried to show, is bigger. But when they're flying high above you, it's very difficult to tell. But this butterfly, as I've said here, oh dear, I've given its name away, it's P.E. Flyer, higher, more determined. This one patrols and glides. Now, I would say that if you see a butterfly a long way up, obviously big and black and white, and it's flying purposefully between trees or across the top of the trees, it's more likely to be this because this butterfly can fly purposefully from tree to tree. But very often, I said this in a talk the other day, and I think it's worth repeating, even if it isn't quite true. It gives you the impression it might be looking for something. It's as if it's going back along a track it's been along once because it thinks it's dropped something. It's trying to find it. So it flies along rather hesitantly rather than purposefully. And every now and again, it spins around and comes back the way it just went and then it retreats back the way it was going originally and it tends to go up and down the same path over and over whereas this species tends to go in one direction and once it's flown out of sight you might not see it again and probably because of the color which is a, an iridescence as you probably know you have to have the wing at exactly the right angle to see that color you've guessed what this species is and based on the color of this, you might have worked out what this one is. They are both really quite scarce in the Chilterns, but they're both present all over the Chilterns. Purple Emperor, caterpillars eat sallows. So anywhere where there's sallow, you might find it. And even in between, because they're extremely powerful flyers and they cover large distances, kilometers, flying about looking for mates and sallows to lay eggs on. The white admiral feeds on honeysuckle and anywhere where there's wood with some honeysuckle, the white admiral is a possibility, but it's a bit tricky to cater for like so many of our British butterflies. It has to lay its eggs on honeysuckle in full shade, but the adults have to be able to fly about in sunny rides or sunny spaces. They don't like the outsides of woods very much. They prefer to be inside a wood flying around in a sheltered ride which is well lit, sunny and warm. But the caterpillars have got to be somewhere quite densely shaded. So that makes this butterfly difficult to cater for. You've got to have some really dark, dense bits of woodland, but with some very bright, sunny bits close by. The purple emperor can find sallows in almost every landscape. So even a single pussy willow growing in someone's garden could host this butterfly a few caterpillars of this butterfly. They're fairly common along canals and stream sides where there are sallows and in woodlands where the clay top allows sallows to be quite common. You also get them, but they tend never to be in large numbers. Neither does the White Admiral, of course. Um, you'll notice I've drawn this lie. You've probably read this while I've been rabbiting on about the eyes. No eyes at all on a White Admiral. The Purple Emperor has eyes. So that's something to look for. The white marks are really very similar. There's one extra white mark here, look, on a purple emperor. Two marks there, two white marks there. White Admiral's only got one. On the underside, the eyes are even more obvious. 
Purple Emperor's got two now. Where's that one come from? Wasn't visible on the upper surface. And the two dots by it. And here, that one single dot isn't really obvious at all. We've now got a stripe. You'll also notice that there's a lot of white at the near the body of the White Admiral. OK, and I've said down here about the fact that the male Purple Emperor is often seen down on the ground looking for minerals which have been proven to help them to uh, find a mate and produce sperm which is better able to fertilize the female. The White Admiral will visit the ground very occasionally but doesn't often do so. So you're much more likely to see the White Admiral on flowers like bramble flowers and other flowers in the uh, shrub layer. The Purple Emperor way up high or down on the ground but you can find female purple emperors searching along the edge of the woods or where there are sallows flying round and round, perhaps about head height. Uh, by the way, purple emperors lay their eggs in the shade, just like the white admiral does, but usually on a bush, which is at least partly in the sun, they lay their eggs on the shady side of it. Okay, now I did mention that I was gonna say this, so I'll just very quickly say, it's a good idea when you're out recording you will see things which are off transect or outside the band of your 2.5 meter either side, five meter wide imaginary box of the wider countryside butterfly survey. You can stick them into something like this smart smartphone app. This is the, you might recognize, this is the new version, free to download from Google Play or the iPhone store. Um, that's called iRecord Butterflies very good because it helps you with locating precisely where you are. It doesn't do moths at all. If you prefer waiting till you get home and looking at what you wrote down or remember, then you, on the PC there's this very good app for recording butterflies you saw outside your survey. And other stuff that you saw, the best place for it I think is iRecord. Some people like iNaturalist, nothing wrong with that at all iRecord was produced in this country for this country's wildlife and just occasionally with iNaturalist you get the American name of something coming up which is similar and a bit confusing uh, for a species which looks identical. So I prefer iRecord but I'm not going to say that iNaturalist is bad because it obviously isn't, it's a very good program. And on iRecord you can record literally everything you've seen from the plants through all the little creatures, the insects and arachnids and so on right the way up to the mammals and the birds. So there we go.